quiet suburban town, undone by an unspeakable crime. Somebody went into the house and somebody murdered them. All I know is that it wasn't my son. The Bellevue police were incredibly baffled. He knew they were dead because he had already killed them. To unravel the twisted plot, investigators go undercover to track the killers. They were duped, plain and simple. They just got beat. I was dispatched to a code three call, which is an emergency lights and siren type of call. There's been some kind of break-in. Uh, my friend, his mom and dad, uh, we think they're dead. As I came up this street right here, is a cul-de-sac. I went about halfway around it. I don't think it's safe here. Please, fast, okay? Yes, they're Please. on the way. Uh, we'll be outside. I saw two people come up the back of my car. And they were screaming, this is the place, this is the place, it's bloody, it's horrible, it's terrible. Oh, man. What I saw, a person had been violently killed. There wasn't anything basically left of his head or face. And the person would have been unrecognizable even if I knew who it was. Homicide? At the foot of the bed was a wallet and it was laid open and I could see a Washington State driver's license. The driver's license identifies the man as 56-year-old Tariq Rafay. My first thought was this was a suicide by shotgun. <laughs> we could hear a noise coming from farther down the hall, like someone struggling trying to breathe. I pushed the door open slightly, and it hit something, and I could see, looking down at the floor, the lower half of a figure, you know, the legs. Call an ambulance. Hey, Lincoln 120, I'm gonna need a rescue It is 20-year-old Basma Rafael, barely alive. We have down there! I got The officer called out to me that, hey, we've got another one. 56-year-old Sultana Rafael is lying dead on the family room floor. It was one of the more violent scenes that I had seen. But there was just something not quite right with it. When we came in there, there wasn't a gun. And uh, when we had a closer examination of the scene, it, we realized that this was not a, a suicide at all. Bellevue, Washington police detective Bob Thompson is assigned to the case. Mr. Raffay had been beaten beyond recognition. There was some very, very angry person that was involved with killing him because of the number of blows. The 911 call was placed by Sebastian Burns and his best friend, Atif Rafay, son of the slain couple. The two 18-year-olds are taken to police headquarters for a statement. They had been down here for about five days prior to the murder, visiting from Vancouver. Atif Rafay was a college student at Cornell University, home for the summer. His mother had been asking him to come down and visit. And so he and Sebastian had come down and uh, had been staying in the house. Last Thursday, when I got home, everything was fine. Um, I noticed no problems or family strain. Sebastian and I went to dinner at the Factoria Keg restaurant. After eating, we went to the Factoria Cinema. The movie ran a little late, and we didn't leave the theater till about 11.30. Atif and Sebastian say they left Bellevue and drove to an all-night cafe in downtown Seattle. 
The boys say they returned home shortly before 2 a.m. As we walked by the family room, I saw my mother lying on the floor. They also said they found signs of a break-in. They had gone over to the room that Sebastian was staying in. They discovered that that room had been ransacked. I went upstairs, and I went into my father's room. They went as far as the doorway, possibly inside the door a little bit further, and noted that there was blood uh, all over the walls, all over Mr. Ruffay's face, and he was dead. At the same time this is all happening, Atit said that he had heard his sister in her room and she was moaning. Of course we asked, well, what did you do? Well, I, he said he didn't do anything. There was nothing he could do to help her. And during the chaos, he looks in his own room and believes that his Walkman is missing. And uh, he brought that to our attention. Atif also says his VCR was taken. They had been up most of the night, so it was just a brief statement. We told them we'd try and get back with them later um, and take a more detailed statement. Since the boys had walked through a crime scene, police collect their clothes and shoes as evidence. Officers provide them with new clothing and put them up at a motel. A few hours later, Atif Rafay's sister, Basma, dies. Bellevue police are now faced with a baffling triple homicide and two teenagers with a questionable story. We are following a breaking news story in Bellevue, a triple murder. Hours after police find the Raffae family murdered, the story breaks. Reporters descend on the affluent Seattle suburb of Bellevue. To find them. Police are still saying they do not believe this was a random killing. Detectives say there are three separate crime scenes. People were definitely freaked out. We've got this quiet little cul-de-sac, really nice homes. You know, people know their neighbors. They say hi to each other. The kids, you know, stay out all night playing until it gets dark. Sarah Jean Green covered the story for the Seattle Times. As far as the police investigation, in those early days, the, the, the Bellevue police were incredibly baffled. It certainly unnerved an entire community. People just were very afraid and very upset. Quite frankly, it's horrifying. And I'm not feeling too comfortable. This kind of thing, there is no room for it in this country whatsoever. There is no room for hatred. For police, the question was, why? Tariq and Sultana Rafay were a devoutly religious couple, originally from East Pakistan. They had just moved to Bellevue, having lived in Vancouver for a number of years. The Rafays were extremely well educated. Tariq Rafay was a renowned structural engineer. His wife, Sultana, was trained as a nutritionist. They were a very quiet, intelligent couple. Um, by all accounts, Tariq Rafay was a brilliant man. Fairly reserved and had this incredible generosity of spirit, this incredible kindness. And people sought him out for his wisdom. Sultana Rafay devoted her life to the care of their autistic daughter, Basma. Basma Rafay was able to communicate with her mother much more than anyone else, and a lot of it was through the eyes and touches and body language. And then there was Atif, the only surviving member of the family. Atif Rafay was a brilliant scholar as well. He got a full scholarship to Cornell. Forensic investigators combed the house, trying to figure out how the Rafay family was murdered. In viewing the scene, there was a blood pattern next to Mr. Rafay's bed on the floor. It was just a round pattern. It looked like someone leaned on the end of a baseball bat. They find that same round pattern in Basma's bedroom. There was baseball bat indentations on the drywall inside the room, and there clearly was a struggle that took place. So I think it's clear she knew her attacker um, when she was killed. Investigators find small pieces of aluminum in the drywall. 
They're now convinced the murder weapon was a baseball bat. The search goes on. The next day, we realized that there was blood in the shower. We'd sprayed it uh, with a chemical, and it had a reaction for human blood. So we knew at that time that the killer had showered. Killers don't typically murder a family and then spend some time in there cleaning up. This is an unusual occurrence. Who would do that? Who would shower? Someone either that is familiar with the residence, familiar with the family, or familiar with people coming and going in that house. 21 hairs are found on the shower floor and a single hair on Dr. Raffae's bed sheet. All are taken for testing. Next, they examine the ransacked room where Sebastian Burns was staying. It was made to look like a burglary had taken place. Boxes were turned over, drawers had been opened, but nothing had been gone through. For Detective Thompson, the evidence just isn't adding up. Here you have this killer going through the house, killing people, then taking a shower, and then in addition, he, he murders three people for a VCR and a Walkman. The analysis of Atif and Sebastian's clothes and shoes raises even more suspicion. We didn't find any blood anywhere except the back of Atif's pant leg. It was one minute drop that belonged to Tariq Rafay. Now, investigators take a closer look at the boy's alibi. The night of the murder, they're very busy. They eat dinner at the house, then they go to the keg restaurant and have dinner, then they go to a movie, then they leave there and they go to a Steve's broiler. And every one of these people at this, this alibi remembered them. At the restaurant, the waiter remembers carding the boys when they ordered wine. At the movie theater, an employee recalled Sebastian making a ruckus at the concession stand. And at the all-night cafe in downtown Seattle, a waitress remembers the boys leaving a $5 tip on an $8 bill. The guy at the movies remembered him. The waiter at the uh, keg restaurant remembered him. For Thompson, the alibi is almost too perfect. It feels set up. Detectives arrange another meeting with Atif and Sebastian at the motel where police have put them up. My reason for contacting them was to get more specific information because it's all in the details. And if you're talking about the truth, it's easy to do that. Thompson and Gomes take Atif to a park and question him. He appeared to be somewhat uncomfortable in going into specifics. He wanted it to be general. Did you think your mother was dead? Well, I said, how do you know she's dead? He says, well, it was obvious. I said, OK, articulate to me. What do you mean by she was obviously dead? And he, he just couldn't do it. Did you call out for her to have her say anything? I was talking. I don't think I was talking at the top of my voice just talking under my breath. He does nothing. I mean, this is your mother. You come into the home and you find your mother face down in a pool of blood. I mean, you don't run over to her, roll her over, or yell at her or something. And then he goes on to say his sister was moaning in the next bedroom with the door closed. So what does that tell you? She's alive? She's alive. And what do you do? I didn't do anything. And that was the most suspicious issue for me. OK, your sister's moaning. He knows she's autistic. She can't speak. What do you do? He says, well, I don't, I don't know any first aid. I, I can't help her. I said, how do you know you need to help her? You haven't seen her. Atif's behavior after the murders also surprises police. He hasn't contacted a single relative. We made a number of requests to assist him and contacting family members because he needed support. Here he is in the United States, the Canadian citizen. His entire family is gone. How is he going to live? How is he going to eat? And things of that nature. He was very businesslike, and as a matter of fact, like I say, a very intelligent young man. I found the Bellevue police with what was perhaps the first of six calls. 
I said to him, are you holding the boys for any reason? And he said to me, why would I ask that situation? Why would I ask that question? Now, you have to bear in mind that I had no calls whatsoever from the Bellevue police to say, gee, your son just walked into a horrible situation and we thought you'd let you know that he's safe. And I simply said, look, as far as I'm concerned, my son and his friend are in a very horrible situation in a foreign country. And if you're not holding these boys, I just assume they came home. Two days after the murders, on Friday, July 15th, funeral services are held for the Rafays. Friday is important for having a funeral so that many people can pray for the deceased and, you know, they pray for their soul. Family and friends all attend. But Atif and his best friend Sebastian are conspicuously missing. When they didn't show up for the funeral and the family was, became very concerned, where are they? Nobody seemed to know. By the time police track down Atif and Sebastian, it's too late. We checked the border and found out that they had just crossed into Canada. The boys' sudden departure cements police suspicions. Now, Atif and Sebastian are their prime suspects. Once Sebastian Burns and Atifa Faye crossed into Canada, the American police really had no jurisdiction. At that time, we didn't have enough probable cause. And so there really wasn't anything to stop them from going across the border. I met the boys at home. They were picked up at the bus depot by my wife. And we turned on the television to see if there was any news about this. And lo and behold, we had officers being interviewed about the funeral. He's not in our custody nor in our care, so you know we can't force him to call or return phone calls to the family. I know they're concerned, but for why he won't talk to the family, we have no idea. That's the only time that I ever saw a thief emotionally totally distraught. He said something to the effect, You bastards, those bastards. Atif tells Mr. Burns he knew nothing about plans for a funeral and that police deliberately withheld that information from him. He immediately got on the phone to Detective Thompson and Thompson did not return his call. That same night, Sebastian visits his high school girlfriend, Sarah Isaacs. As soon as Sebastian came back, he came over. He didn't say much. He acted like he had been through a horrible experience. When I dared to ask something about what had happened, he was mortified and couldn't talk about it. Detectives Thompson and Gomes are determined to question the suspects, even though it means crossing into Canada, where they have no legal authority whatsoever. It became an entirely different ball game going into Canada. They had no authority here. They couldn't even carry guns here. My job was to introduce them, explain why they were here, and just assist them in interviewing people. Fontaine and the detectives tracked down Atif at a friend's house. The officers asked if Atif could come out and have lunch with them, because they had a few questions to ask him. Hey, come on, Atif, we'll buy you lunch. And Atif declined. Then he said, look, you have any questions to ask me? Go ahead and ask me here. I have nothing to hide. And that was met with the response, Atif, don't with us. Come out here right now. From that point on, Atif and Sebastian refused to speak with authorities. Stonewalled, detectives start digging into their past. At their high school, Thompson learns that Sebastian and Atif are considered the best and brightest. Classmates remember they were both enamored with the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche and his beliefs. 
Among human beings, you have the very, very intelligent. And those people who are very intelligent have an extra responsibility to the rest of humankind to try to use that. Therefore, being able to somehow not have moral rules apply to you. One of the first teachers we spoke to knew both Atif and Sebastian, and when told that we were looking at them in their relationship to this homicide in Bellevue, her first reaction to us was, well, when you think of Sebastian Burns, think of David Koresh. He had always been told that he was bright at school, and I think he believed that was true. He also has a kind of socially awkward way of behaving that just makes him seem even more arrogant than he really is. Atif, he's a leader in his own right, and they were equals. There was no sense in which one was leading the other. Both of them apparently thought they were smarter than police. Back in Bellevue, investigators go over Atif and Sebastian's stories with a fine-tooth comb. In his statement to police, Atif said he stood at the entrance to the master bedroom and saw that his father was dead. Detective Thompson and I believe that he could not have seen the actual injury to his father's head. We went back there to look ourselves, and if I was there, I could not make out any specifics that far away from the door. You couldn't see the blood all over his face. You couldn't see blood on the wall. You couldn't see blood all over in the room. You wouldn't have known that um, just coming into the house and describing this crime scene to us. Police believe the Raffaes were killed at approximately 10.15 p.m. when Sebastian and Atif say they were at the movies. Nobody saw them leave. People remember seeing them come, seeing them while they were there, but nobody remembers them leaving. So, you know, that's, that's just one of the gaps. Even if they stayed for the entire movie, they still had over an hour before they arrived in Seattle. So they could easily drive up to the house, commit the murder, and then still go over to Seattle. A waitress saw them at 20 minutes to 2. The 911 call was made at 2.01 a.m. Atif and Sebastian would have to have driven from downtown Seattle to the Raffae House in Bellevue, find the bodies, and call 911, all in 21 minutes. Thompson puts their story to the test. I was already sitting in my car and just drove straight to the house, and it took 18 minutes. I'm driving the most direct route. I don't know that they would have known the most direct route. I believe that they just drove in, they parked their car, and just went in and made the 911 call. He knew they were dead because he had already killed them. If Atif and Sebastian had murdered the Raffae family, they planned the crime perfectly. To catch them, investigators would have to go undercover and outsmart them. In February 1995, the Raffae murder investigation takes a dramatic turn when the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, get involved. They were receiving a lot of news reports in Canada about these two murder suspects running around in the streets of Vancouver. So they sent three detectives to Bellevue to review the file. They wanted to get involved in this case because they believed not only did they do it, but they were going to kill someone again. For seven months now, Canada has been a safe haven for Atif and Sebastian. After first living with the Burns family, Sebastian and Atif rent a house in North Vancouver with their high school friend, Jimmy Miyoshi. They couldn't get a job because they were notorious. And like all kids, they tend to stay up all night and then sleep all day. But Sebastian and Atif are working on a project. They are writing a screenplay. They lived there, they rented expensive cars, they had brand new Mustangs that they were driving at the time, and it was known to the neighborhood as being a bit of a party house. 
The boy's cushy lifestyle is all paid for with money a thief inherits. As the sole survivor of the family, he is entitled to all of it. And according to family members, Atif was very anxious to get his hands on that money. It's hardly 10 days, not even 10 days, you know, the dirt on the grave may not be yet dried up, as we say, and he's asking me if he wants, to, he wants the money, he wants to sell the house. The estate is valued at almost $500,000. But investigators would soon learn that Atif may have been motivated by more than just greed. It wasn't simply about money, although that doesn't hurt. What we learned is that Atif Rafay's family had moved from Canada. He had no friends here. He knew no one. His father was a devout Muslim. Atif Rafay did not embrace his father's Muslim beliefs. His mother dressed in the traditional gear that embarrassed Atif Rafay. If you look at the photographs, every time you see him in a photograph with his family, he looks disgusted at the very notion of having to sit for a photograph with his family. And finally, he was embarrassed by this 20-year-old autistic sister. Now convinced that Sebastian and Atif committed the murders, the RCMP immediately opened their own investigation. The RCMP is the equivalent of the FBI in our country. There was an unbelievable amount of resources poured into this case. RCMP surveillance teams bugged the boy's house and cars and wiretapped the telephone. Then they sit back and listen. But the RCMP comes up with nothing. It seems that Atif and Sebastian may have gotten away with the perfect crime. But investigators have one last plan in store an undercover operation called Project Estate, with RCMP agents posing as mobsters. They had to make these two believe that these undercover operators posing as crime figures could offer them something that would, that would give Atif Rafe and Sebastian Burns the motive or some reason to discuss what they'd actually done. They call it a Mr. Big scenario. The person you're targeting believes that the undercover operatives are members of an organized crime family. And Mr. Big is the boss. The agents trail Sebastian to a hair appointment downtown. In the parking lot, an RCMP officer posing as a mobster approaches Sebastian. He says his car door is jammed and he needs a lift. I just need to lock myself out of my car. Maybe you can help me out. All right. The car ride turns into a drink at a nearby bar. That's where Sebastian tells the mobster about a screenplay he and Atif are writing. It's about two brilliant young boys wrongfully convicted of murder and put to death. The mobster says he may know backers for the film. Back at home, Sebastian excitedly tells his roommates about his new friend. Over the course of the next few months, there are several meetings around Vancouver between Sebastian and the mobsters. Each time, Sebastian reports back to Atif. Everything's going according to plan. Now that the agents have gotten Sebastian's trust, Mr. Big gives him a job to do. The first time that they did money laundering over on Vancouver Island in the city of Victoria, they paid Sebastian Burns and Jimmy Miyoshi $2,000 for their effort, and he can be heard outside of the presence of any undercover operators telling his best friend, crime is so cool, look at this, $2,000. As the months pass, Sebastian begins to feel like he's one of the boys. Finally, he starts opening up. He confides to his mob friends that the Bellevue police are fabricating evidence against him and his friend Atif for the triple murders in Bellevue. They had a conversation with Sebastian Burns in a hotel room where he started talking about having evidence blown up. If these criminals could help him destroy evidence in the States... The mobsters agree to help. Salo. A couple of weeks later, RCMP agents conceal a video camera in a hotel room. Sebastian is then shown a fabricated evidence list. 
The mobsters tell him they can have the items destroyed, but only on one condition. If they would only confess and tell him everything, then he would use his connections to have that evidence destroyed. But, you know, you better tell me everything because if you guys get arrested, who's going to be the first guy you rat out? It's going to be me. And, you know, I can't have that kind of threat to my organization. And so the implication was, you know, you're going to be killed because you're going to be a threat to me and to my criminal organization if you get arrested. Within minutes, Sebastian starts talking. Well, you broke guys a couple of names and said, hey, let's go off your family and get all their money. Basically. Essentially, yeah, I mean. How do you do three people at once? A few days later, a thief shows up to meet them. In less than 15 minutes after he met them for the first time, he walked in, and while sipping a beer and giggling like a schoolgirl, he confessed to the murder of his mother, father, and 20-year-old autistic sister. Did he fight? Um, uh, yeah. Well, that's a story that hasn't really been told, because... I think you want to tell me. Um, well, basically, uh, the father was uh, nothing, and curious episode was um, the sister who basically, um, yeah, was standing up and walking around or whatever. So, <laughs> yeah. I thought it was very powerful. I just found it incredible that um, a person could sit and laugh at the murder of his own sister, um, that they could jovially um, talk about how they killed a family. On July 31st, 1995, Sebastian Burns and Atif Rafay are arrested and charged in the murders of Tariq, Sultana, and Basma Rafay. It's something that is absolutely incomprehensible to uh, people. A whole family, a uh, mom, dad, and a sister murdered by the son and a friend of the son simply for greed and the money. Rafe and Burns are taken into custody in Vancouver, outsmarted at last. They were duped, plain and simple. All I know is that it wasn't my son and it wasn't a teeth. The RCMP made an arrest last night regarding our investigation into the conspiracy. And I had a phone call from a lawyer telling me that the boys had confessed. That was the first I ever knew that there was any kind of shakedown going on. Burns and Rafay plead not guilty, saying they were so scared of the mobsters that they told them what they wanted to hear. On not one occasion did the undercover operators go to his house to pick him up and take him to where they were meeting. He voluntarily made arrangements for his own ride or asked that one of the undercover operators pick him up somewhere away from his home, and he voluntarily went to each and every one of these meetings. Back in Washington state, King County prosecutors want Burns and Rafay extradited and call for the death penalty. That's when the case really hits a snag. The only thing that is being asked is that they are surrendered with the assurances of the federal government of the United States and the state government that they will not be executed. The years go by. Two years after they had been arrested there in Canada, yeah. You know, you want to get a resolve to the case. It's frustrating and it's two years is a long time to wait. Two years of legal wrangling turns into six. Then, finally, there's a compromise. The King County prosecutors take the death penalty off the table. In April 2001, Burns and Rafay are returned to the United States. A trial date is set, and it looks like an end is in sight. But the defendants seem determined to hold up the trial. Atif Rafay has issues with his attorneys for whatever reason. He's just not getting along with them. He wouldn't sit beside them at the defense table. He would go to the jury box and sit in the jury box during some of these hearings. 
and Sebastian Burns is caught having sex with his court-appointed attorney in the interview room, forcing yet another delay. She did not admit to having sexual intercourse, but her defense was that it was a hug that had gone bad, which, considering the jail guard's description, is a little bit difficult to believe. I'm quite certain that um, Teresa probably really liked my son. He's a very likable guy. In March 2004, almost 10 years after the triple murders, the trial finally begins. Sebastian Burns and Atif Rafay are now 28 years old. The prosecution comes heavily armed. Not only do they have the confession tape, but they have a star witness, Jimmy Miyoshi, Sebastian and Atif's friend, who was also arrested for conspiracy to murder. In return for immunity, Miyoshi tells the jury what he knows about the planning and execution of the murders. I remember him telling me um, about how he had, I guess, veered his mother um, into the basement. Did you say lured? Yes. Okay. And that um, Sebastian had struck her from behind in the basement. In a risky move, Sebastian Burns takes the stand. He tells the jury how he was intimidated by the undercover officer who called himself Al. Al wanted me to give him an A to Z story about the crime so that he could go and sabotage the evidence. Uh, I did not have an A to Z story about the crime because we didn't do it. And um, he, on the one hand, was pushing me to give him a story. On the other hand, he was telling me that if the information wasn't accurate, that his guy would find out about it um, at one point. And what did that mean? If the information wasn't accurate, his guy would find out about it. What consequence did you think that meant to you? Well, potentially that I would be dead, that I would be killed. Throughout these scenarios, you see that Sebastian's playing a role. He's playing the role of the tough guy, and he's not being himself. Yeah, I can't believe this, man. This Al, forget about it. These guys had long hair, they were menacing, they were playing the role of violent, scary, tough guys, and they looked the part, they acted the part. That's the kind of atmosphere that was created by these undercover officers. And if he doesn't look afraid, it doesn't mean he wasn't afraid. The prosecutor then brings up a statement Sebastian reportedly made to a former high school classmate. I want to try to kill someone one day. I'd like to see how it would feel because I think I would find it enjoyable. Did you make a statement to that effect, sir? I do believe I said something like that, yes. He was a narcissist whose downfall was brought about by his hubris, by his incredible arrogance. Sebastian Burns had somehow thought he'd planned the perfect murder, but then he made the big mistake of speaking about it. So that was, you know, very much the state's contention. They just got beat. They fell in with two guys who were a lot smarter than they were, and Sebastian Burns wasn't smart enough to figure it out. I didn't murder the Rafay family. I didn't do it. I did not commit this crime. Thank you. Do you have any reaction, Mr. Burns? After 10 long years, the case finally comes to an end. We, the jury, find the defendant, Glenn Sebastian Byrne, guilty of the crime of murder in the first degree. We, the jury, find the defendant, Atif Ahmed Rafay, guilty of the crime of murder in the first degree. When the jury came back, it wasn't a big surprise. It was a relief. Back off. Give us some room. Thank you. Ten years was finally over, and justice had been served. At sentencing, Rafay and Burns make statements. I was probably closer to my mother than to any other person that I ever will be. And the memory of her wit and her charm and her keen human sympathy, they're dear to me to this day. We were unable to tell this jury what other suspects we knew what the murder weapon was before anybody else did. 
the way that Sebastian Burns babbled on for an hour and 40 minutes at the time the sentence was imposed is, I think, a snapshot of his true psychopathy. I think any objective professional, any objective layperson would agree that we were defending ourselves in this trial with both arms tied behind our backs. Mr. Burns, you're not immoral. You're amoral. You have no moral rudder whatsoever. You are an arrogant, convicted killer. Atif and Sebastian are sentenced to three consecutive life terms without possibility of parole. Is there anything you say about your sentence? In Vancouver, Sarah Isaacs remains determined to see both Atif and Sebastian go free. I think the verdict has made me very angry. That anger has given me a kind of drive to encourage people to look at the facts of this case. Because if you're reasonable and if you look at the facts of this case, you'll decide they're innocent. The 10-year ordeal is now over. For law enforcement, it is a victory won after years of patience and persistence. But for both families, there is just overwhelming sadness. What an absolute waste. Two, you know, young, brilliant lives. Sure, maybe they were arrogant little punks at school or, or whatever. And yeah, they are convicted murderers. The whole thing is just incredibly sad. An entire family is wiped out. And these two young lives are cut short.